All right, so today we're going to talk about the properties of the hair and the scalp. So hairstylists play an important role in many people's lives and all hair services must be based on a thorough understanding of the growth, structure and composition of the hair. Trichology is the scientific study of the hair, its diseases and its care. Hair root, this is the part of the hair located below the surface of the epidermis, that's the outer layer of the skin, and the hair shaft projects above the epidermis. So the word trichos meaning hair, this is derived from Greek. And ology means the study of, so trichology is the study of hair, its diseases, and its care. So the hair follicle, this is a tube-like depression or pocket in the skin or scalp that contains the root. Hair follicles are distributed all over the body, with the exception of the palms of the hand and the soles of the feet. The follicle extends downward from the epidermis into the dermis, that's the inner layer of the skin, where it surrounds the dermal papilla. Sometimes more than one hair will grow from a single follicle. The hair bulb, this is the lowest part or a part of the hair strand. It's thick and club-like structure that forms the lower part of the root. The lower part of the bulb fits over and covers the dermal papilla. And the dermal papilla is a small cone-shaped elevation located at the base of the hair follicle that fits into the hair bulb. It contains blood and nerve supply that provides the nutrients needed for growth. Erect papilla muscles, this is um, a minute involuntary muscle fiber in the skin. It's inserted at the base of the hair follicle. Um, fear or cold causes them to contract, which makes the hair stand up, resulting in goosebumps. Your sebaceous glands, these are the oil glands of the skin and are connected to the hair follicles, and they secrete a substance called sebum, which lubricates the hair and the skin. The hair cuticle is the outermost layer of the hair. These are like scales on a roof or shingles on a roof. They overlap. They're scale-like, the cuticle layer provides a barrier that protects the inner structure of the hair as it lies tightly against the cortex. It's responsible for creating shine and the smooth, silky feel of the hair. The cortex is your middle layer. It's a fibrous protein core formed by elongated cells containing melanin pigment. About 90% of the hair weight comes from the cortex. Protein structures located in the cortex provide hair elasticity, that ability to stretch and then snap back. Um, changes resulting from chemical services occur in the cortex. The medulla is the innermost layer. It's composed of round cells. It's very fine. And naturally, blonde hair may not even have a medulla. Thick hair, thick coarse hair and beard hair always contain a medulla. The medulla is not involved in any salon services. So hair is approximately 90% protein, and the protein is made up of long chains of amino acids, which in turn are made up of elements. The major elements that make up human hair are carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur, and are often referred to as combs. That's the acronym. These are the five elements that are found in skin and nails also. So combs, the acronym stands for carbon, which makes up 51%, oxygen, 21%, hydrogen, 6%, nitrogen, 17%, and sulfur, 5%. Keratinization is the, mat the maturing process of living cells that originate within the hair follicle. As these newly formed cells mature, they fill up with a fibrous protein called keratin, and I'm sure you've seen keratin um, listed in the names of different hair products out there. 
So after they fill with keratin, the cells move upward. They lose their nucleus and die. And by the time the hair shaft emerges from the scalp, the cells of the hair are completely keratinized and are no longer living. We don't have any filling in our hair. And the hair shaft that emerges is um, composed of keratinized protein. So amino acids are linked like pop beads. I'm sure some of y'all remember the little pop beads that baby played with where they could pop them together or take them apart. Um, peptide or M bonds and M bonds um, are chemical bonds that join amino acids. Polypeptide chains. This is when um, amino acids are joined together and they form a long chain of the amino acids linked by peptide bonds, which is called a poly, poly meaning many. Proteins are long coiled complex polypeptides made of amino acids. The spiral shape of the coil protein is called a helix, which is created when the polypeptide chains intertwine with each other. So side bonds um, is something that we need to be familiar with. Um, the cortex is made up of millions of polypeptide chains and polypeptide chains are cross-linked like rungs on a ladder by three different types of side bonds and they link the polypeptide chains together and are responsible for the extreme strength and elasticity of the human hair. They are essential to services such as wet styling, thermal styling, permanent waving, and chemical hair relaxing. A hydrogen bond is a weak physical cross-linked side bond that is easily broken by water. They are weak individually, but because there are so many, they account for about one third of the hair strength. A salt, salt bond is another weak cross link side bond that can be broken by changes in pH. They are easily broken by strong alkaline or acidic solutions and account for about one third of the hair's overall strength. The disulfide bond, a strong chemical side bond, um, joins the sulfur atoms of two neighboring cysteine amino acids to create cysteine and the cysteine joins together two polypeptide strands and although there are fewer disulfide bonds than hydrogen or salt bonds disulfide bonds are so much stronger that they account again for one third of the hair's overall strength disulfide bonds are what we are concerned with in some of our chemical processes a lanthanide bond occurs from hydroxide chemicals like a sodium hydroxide relaxer and it breaks those disulfide bonds which is going to give you that straighter form. So here's a chart that describes um, the bonds of the hair again. So the hydrogen is broken by water or heat like if we were doing a roller set and then we dry the roller set and we cool it and it takes the form of the roller. Um, changes in pH um, involves the salt bond and uh, it's reformed by normalizing the pH and the sulfide bonds are the strong, uh, stronger bonds and they are broken by thioperms and relaxers, hydroxide relaxers, extreme heat. Okay, and they're reformed by oxidation with a neutralizer or converted to lanthanide bonds. Peptide is a strong N-bomb and uh, it's broken by chemical depilatories. It's not reformed as the hair dissol dissolves. So this would be like your Neat, Nair, Beat, I think, uh, remember, is a brand. Um, and it has the same ingredient as a sodium hydroxide relaxer. Just the time and the amount that you leave it on there and the strength of the product, it dissolves the hair. So Sodium hydroxide is in your hair removal. It's also in your sodium hydroxide um, or lye hair relaxers. Hair pigment. The melanin is tiny grains of pigment. Eumelanin provides dark brown, black hair color. Pheomelanin provides yellow to red ginger color. The natural hair color results as a ratio or percentage of eumelanin to pheomelanin, and gray hair has no melanin. So wave patterns, we have straight hair, wavy hair, curly hair, extremely curly hair. 
Um, natural wave patterns are the result of genetics, although there are many exceptions as a general rule. Asians and Native, Native Americans tend to have extremely straight hair. Con um, co excuse me, Caucasians tend to have straight, wavy, or curly hair, and African Americans tend to have extremely curly hair. But straight, wavy, curly, extremely curly can occur in all races. Anyone of any race or mixed race can have varying degrees of curl from straight to extremely curly. Curly hair is oval in shape and extremely curly hair grows in long twisted spirals. Cross sections appear flattened in varying shape and thickness along their length and has a fairly irregular diameter showing varying diameters along a single strand. So the truth about hair growth, we have two types of hair. We have bealous hair, which is short, fine, downy, unpigmented hair, and then we have terminal hair, which is long, thick, pigmented hair on scalp, legs, arms, and body. Um, women normally retain about 55% more bealous hair than men, um, and terminal hair, again, will occur on the scalp, legs, arms, and bodies of males and females. It is coarser than bealous hair, with the exception of gray hair. It is pigmented, and it usually does have a medulla. So there's three growing phases to the hair. We have the antigen phase, which is the growing phase. The overall average growth of a healthy scalp is about half an inch. 90% of the hair is growing in the antigen phase at one time, and it grows for a period from two to six years. The duration of hair life is affected by gender, age, type of hair, heredity, nutrition, and health. Catagen is the transition phase that ends the growth phase, and this only lasts one to two weeks. The follicle canal shrinks and detaches from the dermal papilla. The hair bulb disappears, and the shrunken root ends form a rounded club. Less than 1% of the hair is in the catagen phase at any time. Telogen is the resting phase. After catagen, the follicle begins a three to six month phase of resting. About 10% of the hair is in a telogen phase at one time. After telogen, the cycle begins again. The entire growth cycle repeats itself every four to five years. So some myths about hair growth. Um, shaving, clipping, cutting the hair on the head makes it grow back faster, darker, and coarser. The fact is shaving or cutting the hair on the head has no effect on hair growth. Scalp mas massage increases hair growth. There is no evidence to indicate this is true. Minoxidil and finasteride are the only treatments that have been proven to increase hair growth and are approved for the purpose by the FDA. Gray hair is coarser or more resistant. Um, other than lack of pigment, gray hair is exactly the same as pigmented hair. It is not resistant because it's gray and is not more, more resistant than the pigmented hair on the same person's head. The amount of natural curl is always determined by racial background. Again, anyone of any race or mixed race can have any um, wave, straight, curly, extremely curly hair. It's also true within races, individuals have varying have hair with varying degrees of curls in different areas of the head. Your curl does not have the same tension all over your head. Some can be tighter, some can be looser. Hair with a round cross section is straight, hair with a oval cross section is wavy, and hair with a flat cross section is curly. Cross section means they have cut that hair and viewed it under a microscope. Hair loss is a natural shedding of hair, and it accounts for daily normal hair loss. Um, recent measurements indicate the average rate of hair loss is about 35 to 40 hairs per day. So some shedding is normal. Emotional impact of hair loss, um, perception of bald and balding men, um, they can be considered less attractive, less assertive, less successful, less likable, and older by five years. Now, not everyone thinks this about balding or bald men. Some women think a bald head is sexy. Okay, so men can have negative and social emotional effects, preoccupation with baldness, um, make an effort to conceal, and women, it, I think it is more devastating for women. It can cause this anxiety, a feeling of helplessness and unattractiveness, because, you know, to um, most women, you know, their hair is a very big part of their identity. 
So types of abnormal hair loss, abnormal hair loss is called alopecia. The three most common types of abnormal hair loss are androgenic alopecia, alopecia areata, and postpartum alopecia, postpartum meaning after pregnancy. Androgenic alopecia is the progressive shrinking or miniaturization of terminal hair, and it affects millions of men and women in the United States. Alopecia areata, this is a sudden loss in round or irregular patches. It affects 5 million people in the U.S. Immune system attacks their hair follicles, and it can begin with small bald patches, and it occurs, it occurs in males and females of all ages and races. If you start uh, experiencing this type of um, hair loss where you've got round patches, you do need to seek medical attention. It could be due to a disease or an autoimmune disorder. Um, so it is something you'd want to seek a doctor's advice about. Postpartum alopecia, this is temporary hair loss at the conclusion of pregnancy. Growth cycle returns to normal within a year after delivering a baby. It took a year just about to make that baby. It's going to take you about a year to recover from having that baby. Minoxidil is a topical treatment. Um, it's over-the-counter. Finasteride was prescription only. I'm not sure if finasteride is still available. I feel like it may have been pulled due to uh, impact on your liver function levels, um, but that might be something you want to look up. So recognizing disorders of the hair. Canities can be congenital or acquired, and this is a technical term for gray hair um, caused by a loss of natural pigment. Con congenital canities exist at or before before birth, um, occurs mostly in albinos, occasionally in a person with a normal hair. You'll see somebody's got a skunk stripe, as I call it. Um, acquired canities is usually due to aging. It can onset prematurely in adult life, and it may be developed due to prolonged anxiety or illness. Hypertrichosis, superfluorous hair, also known as Hiroshi's, characterized by the growth of terminal hair in areas of the body that normally only grow vilous hair. And it can be tweezed, removed by depilatories, electroly electrolysis, shaving, or epilation. Y'all forgive me. Trichoptilosis is a technical term for split hair ends, and it can be treated with conditioner to lubricate and soften the ends, and of course, by cutting. So some other disorders, trichorexis nodosa is a knotted hair, a dry, brittle condition, including formation of nodules swelling along the hair shaft. The hair breaks easily, which can create a brush-like spreading of the fibers along the shaft. Um, it's treated by softening the hair with conditioners and moisturizers. Monothorax is beaded hair, hair that breaks between the beads of the nose, and it can be, it can be treated with conditioning. And um, frigidulous, fragile, y'all forgive me, fragilitus cranium, brittle hair, which causes splitting, and it's treated with hair and scalp conditioning. Sometimes I get tongue-tied. Um, so, so again, some more disorders, pityriasis, this is a technical term for dandruff, um, which is an excess production accumulation of skin cells. Um, and the way I remember pityriasis is I pity the person with dandruff, pityriasis. Um, Malaysia, that's the fungus that causes dandruff, and I always relate it to Malaysia, Malaysia. Pityriasis capitis simplex, think cap. This is classic dandruff. Um, it's characterized by itchy scalp and large flakes attached to the scalp or scattered loosely in the hair, and regular use of an anti-dandruff shampoo and conditioner can help. Pityriasis steatoids, this is a more severe case of dandruff, of dandruff characterized by accumulation of greasy or waxy scales mixed with sebum and they stick to the scalp and crust. As explained in chapter eight, skin diseases and disorders, when this is accompanied by redness and inflammation, it's called cerebic dermatitis and this can be found in your eyebrows and beard. So if you've ever encountered someone that their eyebrows that looked red and there was flakes, it's cerebic dermatitis. 
Tinea is the technical term for ringworm, and this is a vegetable parasite. It's highly contagious. Tinea capitis, that's ringworm of the scalp. So think cap, scalp because you can get ringworm on your body. And then tinea favosa is honeycomb ringworm, and it's characterized by dry sulfur, yellow cup-like crust on scalp called scutula, which gives off an odor. And scars from um, the favus are pink or white, shiny ball patches, very contagious, and should be referred to a physician. So some parasitic infections is scabies. This is a highly contagious skin disease caused by a parasite. It's a mite that burrows under the skin and it can cause vesicles, which is blisters and pustules or inflamed pimples with pus, usually form on the scalp from irritation caused by the parasite. And it does cause excessive itching and scratching the area can make it worse and it be, you know, may even result in an infection. A client with this condition must be referred to a, phys um, a physician for medical treatment. Pediculosis capitis. Remember cap head. This is a contagious condition caused by head lice infesting the hair and scalp. Itching occurs and um, it can result, scratching um, can result in an, inf uh, an infection. If you get a client that comes in and sits in your chair and they you notice that they have lice or the nits, you need to very discreetly inform them that you cannot service them and that you have found evidence of lice infestation. And of course, you know, there's shampoos, the spray, um, the combs to get the nits out. They need to wash everything in hot water. They need to vacuum and throw that bag out um, in order to hopefully not get reinfested. But don't embarrass them. Make sure you discreetly tell them and let them, you know, leave the shop with their dignity still intact. So some bacterial infections, a fur uncle, this is a technical technical term for a boil, and it's an acute localized infection of the hair follicle. You need to refer the person to a physician for that. A carbuncle is an inflammation of the subcutaneous tissue. This means under it's not out on top of the skin, it's under the skin. It's caused by staphylococci, and it is similar to a fur uncle, but larger. And then folliculitis is an infection of the hair follicle, and again, it's caused by staph or other bacteria, and they can be seen as small white-headed pimples. Mild folliculitis may heal itself in a few days, but deeper reoccurring ones do need medical attention. Um, a common example in hair salons is folliculitis barbae. This would be from not disaffecting your clippers. Um, also known as barber's itch. So performing a thorough hair and scalp analysis. So we need to look at the hair texture and hair texture is described as coarse, medium and fine. Um, the thickness or the diameter of the individual hair strand. Hair texture can be classified in the three that I mentioned and can vary from strand to strand. Coarse hair has the largest diameter. Diameter is the measure of the circumference around that um, hair strand. It is stronger than fine hair. It's more resistant to processing than medium or fine hair and it usually requires more processing. Um, if you were doing a relaxer or if you were doing a permanent wave or if you were doing a, de uh, a double process where you have to relax the hair and then put curl in it, um, texture is going to play a role. Medium hair is the most common, considered normal, doesn't really pose any problems. And of course, fine hair is more fragile. I, I think of hair diameter or excuse me, hair texture in the terms of thick spaghetti, regular spaghetti and angel hair pasta. Angel hair, angel hair would be your fine. It's going to cook really fast. Medium hair, you know, it's going to be the normal about eight minutes. And then the thicker spaghetti takes longer to cook. But what happens if you overcook it? It turns to mush. So will your hair if you overprocess it. So hair density, this is a measure of the individual hair strands on one square inch. The average density is about 2,200 hairs per one square inch. Um, hair with high density will be considered thick and it has more hairs per square inch. And hair with low density, thin, will have fewer hairs 
per square inch. Um, blondes usually have the highest density. People with red hair tend to have the lowest. Porosity. This has to do with the hair's ability to absorb moisture. The degree of porosity is directly related to the condition of the cuticle layer. Healthy hair with a compact layer is naturally resistant to be uh, being penetrated by moisture and is referred to as hydrophobic. Porous hair with a raised cuticle easily absorbs is hydro, excuse me, let me go back. Healthy hair with a compact cuticle, hydrophobic. And then porous hair has a raised cuticle, um, absorbs moisture easily, is hydrophilic. Hair with a low porosity is considered resistant. So that tight, compact cuticle will make it more resistant to services, chemical services. Um, so chemical services on hair with low porosity need a more alkaline solution to raise and open that cuticle. Hair with average porosity is considered normal. Chemical services performed on this type of hair will usually process as expected. Hair with high porosity is considered overly porous hair. That cuticle is wide open and it's going to suck everything in very quickly. Um, so it can easily be over processed. So you would need to use things more on the acid side or the gent gentler side. Um, sometimes when you color hair that has um, is overly porous, you know, the ends will grab dark because it just sucked it in so quick. And there are products that you can put on the hair to help equalize the porosity so you get a more evil, even development, um, particularly when you're dealing with color. So hair elasticity is the ability of the hair to stretch and return to its original length without breaking. This is an indication of the strength of the side bonds. Normal elasticity will stretch up to 50% and then return to the same length without breaking. Dry hair will only stretch 20%. Low elasticity means that the hair will break easily and it fails to return to its original length. It has low elasticity. This would be that mushy hair I was talking about. Um, it may not be able to hold a curl because you've broken down too many bonds in it um, from a wet set, a thermal styling, or even a permanent wave. Um, it's a result of weak side bonds and chemical services performed on hair with low elasticity require a milder solution with a lower pH to minimize further damage. So growth patterns, um, a hair stream is when the hair flows in the same direction. A whorl is hair that forms in a circular pattern and a cowlick is a tuft of hair that stands straight up. So if you ever get close to a cow, you'll see that their coat has different swirls going in different directions, clockwise, counterclockwise, clock, you know, it's just a mixture. Um, so that's where the term cowlick came from. I remember when my son was a small boy, uh, the young lady that was cutting his hair, you know, mentioned his cowlick that he had, and he turned around and said, I haven't been around any cows. So dry hair and scalp can be caused by inactive sebaceous glands. Again, these are oil glands and they produce sebum because if we didn't have that, we would feel very tight and itchy. Um, and it can be aggravated by excessive shampooing or by a dry client. It should be treated with products that contain moisturizers and emollients. Avoid frequent shampooing along with the use of strong soaps, detergents, or products with a high alcohol content. Some people who are really oily, and when I was a young girl, I was very oily. Very oil, oily skin, very oily hair. And we think, oh, we've got to clean, 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 clean. But when you over cleanse and, you know, We've all done it, used alcohol to wipe our oily skin down. Well, all that does is tell the, the oil glands, oh, we're dry, we need more oil. And that's why you would wipe it down with an astringent or alcohol and it was like in no time you were oily again. So overdoing it with your cleansing um, can actually aggravate a oily skin or scalp condition. Um, you can use normalizing shampoos to kind of help balance. You know, it won't um, strip it too much and it won't over moisturize. Eat a well-balanced diet, exercise, shampoo regularly, and practice good hygiene. And of course, you know, shampoo or dry shampoos are all the rage today. That can help with that. 